Misery loves company, but people go so far. When you're miserable and you're a negative person, you go very far to create misery and negativity in other people's lives. So I've learned to laugh. Some of it doesn't feel good to receive it, but I've learned to laugh at it because you understand that people have a job to do. Haters, being a hater is a full-time job. Being a miserable person who has a job to create misery for other people's lives is a full-time job. I mean, who wants to be unemployed? There are some folks in it that will just hate you because God likes you. You don't have to do anything to them. You don't have to mess up anything. You don't have to start a fight. They don't even have to know you. Most of my haters have never met me. I couldn't have done nothing to you because I don't even know you. How you gonna hate me if you don't even know me? Give me a chance to earn your hate. I just want to talk to you about haters for a second. Because we all got them. Everybody got haters. I didn't even know I had these many haters. Till I go on the internet, there they are. They just waiting on me. They don't even know me. They don't know you. They just be saying stuff. You don't even know where it come from. That's why we have good and we have evil. And at the same time, what I have an appreciation about is if you're online or if you run into somebody and they just so happens to be a hater and they end up saying something to you that will actually change your life and make you a better person. You may not like the way they're saying it, but if they're saying something that's the truth that could actually impact you and make a difference, then you're supposed to remain a student of life to learn, even if what you're learning is coming from a hater. Take the lesson from it grow, mature, understand it, process, and then make the adjustments, and then you keep it moving. Understand that haters have a job to do. Process it, understand it. It balances our world. A leader must have, Napoleon said, a mastery of the details. All can be lost with just a couple of missing details. On the trip to the moon, everything has to work. There's a thousand, several thousand moving parts. There's several thousand pieces to the project of getting to the moon and coming back. And all of them have to work. And then there's the backup systems for something if something goes wrong to back it up. That kind of mastery of detail is so vitally important. The drama is in the details. Master the details. Good advice, Napoleon Hill. Willingness to assume full responsibility. What happened to me might not have been my responsibility. But what I do about it is my full responsibility. If a hailstorm destroys the farmer's crop, he wasn't responsible for that. But his responsibility now begins when the hailstorm is over, when he asks the question of himself, what should I do now? Wherever you are in the world, just do me a favor and share this video. Because just maybe somebody is at home stressed, depressed, frustrated, miserable, because they're on the receiving end of hate on you guys could make a difference in somebody's out there life. Understand, they have a job to do. Look for the lesson in the hate. Learn from it, grow from it, mature from it, process it, and then you keep it moving. I want you to understand that haters have a job to do. You have hate and you have love. Never give a hater a stage to stand on. Because they want nothing more than to be negative or do something negative and then have everybody to give them attention about it. Think about how far a hater will go. I've learned that insecure people will go above and beyond to create insecurities. Hurt people will go above and beyond to hurt people. There is no worse feeling than that of invisibility. You know, when you are doing your very best and it goes unrecognized, it makes it kind of harder to want to keep doing it. And when you feel unseen, especially by the people whose attention and approval you crave the most, it can create a compulsion in your life to start doing things that are not even really consistent with your character in order to receive from people a confirmation that can be taken away just as easily as it was given. So my message is, if you have felt unnoticed, unappreciated, uncelebrated, and insignificant, 
in this kingdom, what is unseen is often what is most significant. We must drive the dark side of our nature into a small corner and let the positive side flourish. Early, we must learn to exercise self-control. Power is a wonderful thing, but it must be exercised properly to benefit, not to destruction. So self-control is certainly necessary to be a strong leader so that you can become the best example. The example of having your temper well managed, having that dark side of your nature under control. The best example of choosing wise words and not being careless, that kind of control. Control of your desires so that they fit into the positive side of life and not the negative side. Self-control, very important. When you decide, I have had enough, a leader is about to be born. Toleration is the graveyard of leaders. And that's why we lack leadership. Everybody wants to be liked. Nobody wants to shrug the boat. And that's why we're not leaders, because we want everyone to agree with us. We still apologize for being successful. We feel ashamed to be in charge. When you still carry your history, you are afraid of success. Because you may lose your friends who ain't going nowhere. Very subtle problems. Your attitude is so powerful, it creates your atmosphere. It also is a source of your natural lifestyle. And if you're going to change your life, you've got to change your attitude. Now here's the bottom line. Your belief system is the source of your attitude. I want to say how much I appreciate you because you hated me on a level that I didn't even know I was on. And you hated me so long that I had to go back and stare at myself to see what you saw in me that made you hate me that bad. And I started discovering who I was because you changed my perception. to everyone who is watching this video. No matter what you are doing to achieve a goal or to accomplish a mission or to improve yourself or change for the good for yourself and you want to see changes in your life, despite of any one of those things that you are focusing on doing, you have to understand something. There are always going to be a certain group of people who are going to hate on you for no apparent reason. But it's going to be dependent on how you respond to it and react to it. You can either react by allowing the negative words of those haters based on what they have said consume you and to let it rule over you and allow the voices of those negative words to get into you and then to the point of defeating that you cannot do it or you can ignore and don't be bothered with it and then stay focused on what you are doing. Have a plan to improvise and then adapt and then overcome in order to accomplish whatever that you are focused on for the good for yourself. If we talk about getting set and free from sin and shame, we need to get set free from people. Not that we don't care about them, but we can't be controlled by them. If you have a certain group of people who are hating on you for no apparent reason, they're sitting there saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you cannot accomplish this, you're not able or capable of doing that. That ain't going to never happen into your life for the good. The first thing you need to do is ignore what they said and don't be bothered with it. And then in the midst of it, while these people are saying all of that jibber jabber and stuff, do not argue with them. Focus and work and move in silence behind closed doors. That's what you need to do. Here's what's called the self-knowledge acid test. Quickly, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Is it a client you've been trying to sign for several months? 
Is it a major sale you've been trying to make? Is it a promotion? Is it a partnership in the firm? Quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Achievements that you want to make. Achievements that will take a while to get. Write them down. Again, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important personal and spiritual goals. Things that will make a difference in your personal life. Is it going to church more often than holidays? Grasping all you can from the Sunday sermon? Is it spending more quality time with your kids? Is it turning the TV off during the dinner hour and actually talking about the important things in life with your family? Is it making more dates with your spouse? Is it planning a much needed family vacation? What is it? What are the important goals in your personal and spiritual life? Is one of them making a conscious effort to exercise more, to eat better, to lose some weight, to get in shape? What are the three most important personal and spiritual goals that you have? Write them down. Doesn't matter what they are, just write them down. Now, take some time to really visualize what the achievement of these goals would look like. What does your future hold for you if you landed that big client? What does your future look like if you got that promotion? If you spent more time with your family? If you planned more outings with your spouse? What does your future look like? Really spend some time on this now. It's important stuff. What does it all look like? Ask yourself, is this really my goal? Is this truly what I want? Is it a positive goal? Is it important enough to me to become what it takes to reach this goal? Is it mine? Is it worth it? If your three goals on the career side and three goals on the personal side don't stand up to these questions, you need to take some time to carefully redefine a few things. Redefine your list. Redefine where it is that these goals came from. Redefine what actually is important to you. Redefine how hard you'll really work to get them. Now, there are two parts to this goal setting and redefining process. There's two parts. Number one, don't set your goals too low. An interesting thing that we teach in leadership, don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure is on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. Now here's the second part on setting goals. Number one is don't set your goals too low. Number two is don't compromise. Don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years, gold at the top, and start listing all reasonable resources. Write down every possible place that you could find the opportunity to achieve this goal. And with each resource, classify them. Ask yourself, is this resource a sure thing? A good bet? About even chances? Unlikely? A long shot? Ask yourself these questions and classify all of the resources you have written down. That's the first step. The second step in this method of self-preparation is to make sure you know what you need to do to be prepared for your opportunity. Take your sure things first. Figure out what you need to do to be prepared when they happen. Break down your preparation into concrete steps. Make sure that you know exactly what you have to do to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes your way. Let's say that one of the top priorities on your career list of goals is to get this new client. Let's take it one step further to say that on your resource list for this goal is to have a lunch meeting with a friend who just happens to be the mentor of the client you're going after. Is this friend of yours a sure bet on your resource list? Well, let's say he is. I mean, you know this guy is a tremendous consulting source for the client you want. The client you want really listens to the opinions and advice of your friend. So you're getting ready to have lunch with your friend. What do you do? 
You've got to make sure that you're up on all the knowledge and the industry data that will impress your friend. Make him realize that he knows someone who could benefit from your knowledge and your vitality and your spirit and your experience. Impress him. Impress him so much that he goes back to his friend, the client you're after, and tells this prospective client of yours that he needs to do business with you. Be prepared. Go through your entire list of goals and resources and classify them. Break each resource into concrete steps of preparation. Start by working on the sure bets first, and then move down the line. The long shots will come through every so often, but start with the resources that will serve you best now. Get ready for the opportunities before they come your way. Step three in the self-preparation method is to do all you can to make each opportunity more likely to happen. After you've determined what you have to do to get ready to be prepared, after you've determined this, see what you can do to expedite the process. What can you do to increase the likelihood of this opportunity? Go over it and over it and over it. Use these three methods again and again as you assess where you are now and where you have to go next to keep moving toward the achievements that are most important to you. Step one, consider your resources. Step two, determine what you have to do to get ready. Step three, expedite the opportunities. And by the way, this method of self-preparation works wherever you are in your journey, whether you're close to your goals or whether you're just starting your journey of self-direction. This method works. Have working knowledge to draw from. Continually work on yourself in preparation of where you want to be. Build a reservoir of thoughts and ideas and philosophies and experiences that are your own. Build, grow, change, get ready, be prepared. Be prepared for a life worth living. Now here are the four ifs that make life worthwhile. Number one, life is worthwhile if you learn nothing worse than being stupid. Life is worthwhile if you learn. Learn from your personal experiences. Learn from other people's experiences. Second, life is worthwhile if you try. Now you've got to take what you've learned and see if you can try your hand at it. Someone says, well, you can't try, you have to do. No, you have to try. I put the bar up two feet and ask the kids who can jump two feet. I can, some say. I can't, some say. I don't know, some say. How are you going to know? You don't. You've just got to try. Just back off and run at it. How are you going to know if you don't try? Now, what if you knock the bar down? Does that mean you can't jump two feet? No. You have to what? Try it again. Of course, you have to try. Try it another way, but try. Try your hand at it. When the record book on you is finished, let it show your wins and your losses, but don't let the record book show that you didn't try. Next, life is worthwhile if you stay. You've got to learn to stay. Now, you don't have to stay forever. Just stay till you see it through. A guy builds a foundation and then he wanders off somewhere and builds another foundation. He's got these foundations scattered all across the country. I mean, no walls, no roofs, just a bunch of foundations. Not a good reputation. Stay. You don't have to stay forever. Just stay to finish something. Don't fall into the trap of less than refined sophistication. Stay till it's over. Stop in yourself, you know, look back at the situation, learn from it. You have been disappointed over and over and over again. And every time you try, you come up short. And some of us have tried, got blocked, tried, got blocked, tried, 
got blocked and I tried so hard and I still got looked over and don't you know it's hard when your expectation has been damaged by disappointment it's a slow damage it's a slow tearing of the muscle fibers it is not one event that creates it it's over and over I tried and I tried and I stayed and I disciplined and I showed up and, and the man has finally gotten to a place where he is tired of trying. You must be very intentional and deliberate. You're not going to wake up one day and find a law degree. You're going to have to work for it. And your problem is you wake up on Monday, you might be strong, but by Wednesday, you're not intentional and deliberate. You are hoping that the best is going to happen to you and the best never happens to you. If you look in the mirror tomorrow and say that, you will change because nobody likes thinking of themselves as a failure. I don't want you to keep doing dumb stuff and say, my life is miserable. No, your life is not miserable. Your ability to make adjustments, to make corrections is messed up. And you're too slow. You're too casual. You think too much. You need to get in a hurry. The separator is going to be who takes massive action quickly. They print money. They don't print time. They don't print opportunities. You can lose money and get it back. You can't get time back. You can't get experiences back. Average people focus on money. The greats focus on time because I can't get my time back. If for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, what would you be like? What would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be 10 times more efficient. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. If you want to make your dream become reality, the people that are running at their dreams know that it's possible that you can live your dream, that it's necessary, that you're relentless, that you have a plan of action, that you are creative. The people that are living their dream are finding winners to attach themselves to. The people that are living their dreams are the people that know that it's, if it's going to happen, it's up to them. And they're resolving within themselves, it's not over until I win. The people that are running after that dream know they're going to have hard times. They keep on running because they're saying within themselves, I'm the one, I'm the one. No matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. The people that are running after their dreams are the people that are hungry. The key is time is precious. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency, and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. When should you start the day? As soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can, leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished. To the best of your ability, it can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. And it might get all upset. It might get torn up and you do a new one. You make so much progress the first 90 days that now you've got, you've multiplied it all by two, by three. Because that happened to me. I thought, wow, here's how, this is gonna be a great year. By the time I'd finished the third month, I'm rolling, I'm sore. So many things are happening, I revised my whole year's plan. Next key, to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny. By the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. 
So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. We give up so quickly. The first time we get turned away, we go home. The first person that doesn't like us, the first person that doesn't help us, the first time it gets a little hard, many of us are so quick to see disappointment as a dead end. If you can't get in, go up. If you can't get through on this level, go up to a higher level. Sometimes the reason God allows you to be restricted is because you're at the wrong level. And sometimes he'll put a disappointment in your life so you have to climb over it. Restoration will come. Healing will come if you won't give up. Anytime trouble comes, anytime heartache comes, anytime disappointment hits their life, rather than face it and walk through it, they quit, they back down, and they waste their pain. Pain has a purpose. Don't let your pain define you. Let your pain refine you. People, they go through something that was supposed to be a season, but instead of it being a season, it dictates their entire life. You met people that instead of getting better, they just got bitter because of the pain. Before you know it, their entire identity is wrapped around their issue. It's wrapped around this moment of heartache, this moment of disappointment. You've met people that have been betrayed by a friend and instead of forgiving, instead of rising back up, instead of being the friend that they're looking for, they isolate and they back down. You meet people that their dreams never came to pass and because the dreams never came to pass, they just now become a critic of anybody else who goes for their dreams. Stay on your path, stay positive, stay encouraged, keep praying. I want you to start praying specific prayers and that way you're going to start witnessing God bless you specifically. Don't feel like you're being greedy or over the top. It's beautiful to recognize when you're blessed, but it's okay to start asking for blessings. And so right now in this era where we are, the people that are going to come out on top, the people that are going to get control of their destiny, the people that are going to maximize this place in history and be fortified in terms of their mental resolve and families and their skills and their ability to create incredible wealth are people that are using their times more productively. The people who take the time to learn something new every day. If you're not willing to learn, nobody can help you. If you're willing to learn, no one can stop you. 80% of the things we do are busy things that we do in an area that is not effective. The average person only spends 20% of their time doing the thing that they are really gifted at, created at, excited to do, and the rest of it is all the dumb stuff that we all have to do in order to survive. Wonder what would happen if we would go from doing 80% of things that are busy but not effective and 20% of the things that are really effective if we would switch those numbers around and only give 20% of our time to the things that we have to do and 80% of our time to the thing that we were created to do.